Well, welcome everyone. My name is Tracy Cook and I work for the Montana State Library. I'm the lead consulting and learning librarian and I work with public libraries around Montana. I am joined today by Nanette Gilbertson, who is the lobbyist for the Montana Library Association. And we'd like to talk to you about the Montana legislature and how you can help us as we advocate for libraries. So welcome Nanette, thank you for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I was wondering if you would start off by just telling us a little bit about yourself and your work as the lobbyist for MLA. Sure. So as Tracy said, my name is Nanette Gilbertson and I work for a government relations association management firm in Helena called Smith and McGowan. We have a variety of nonprofit clients and trade associations, mostly in the um, local government, public safety, public health realm, and that includes the Montana Library Association. I believe, I was trying to remember, but I believe Smith & McGowan has been working for the Montana Library Association since around 2000, and I became kind of the lead lobbyist in 2007. I dipped my toes in in 2005, and in 2007 became the lead lobbyist. Um, I've said for my entire tenure with the Montana Library Association that I love working for librarians because you do research, you do data, you do citations, and you're great at grassroots advocacy. And so that's not to say that there isn't more we can do or, or room for improvement, but you do a great job at, in all of those areas and it makes lobbying um, for this association and for librarians uh, really, really fun and um, a, a great experience. Thank you. And I think you kind of started to answer my second question, which is I think it's really important to talk to librarians and board members about why it's so important and so helpful when they are part of our advocacy network. Would you like to talk a little bit more about that and why they make a difference or how? Absolutely. Um, I think if you look at all of the associations in Montana, uh, we have associations for everything and we have lobbyists for almost everything. If you can think of an advocacy group, there's probably a lobbyist. And so there's a huge benefit to having a hired either contract or employed lobbyist to assist with your advocacy priorities. Um, but constituents are so much better. When I'm in the Capitol day in and day out talking to legislators, um, I become kind of a, just a known quantity or a constant face. And I'm not their constituent. I have my legislators here in Helena that I can talk to about issues personal to me. But it is so much more impactful when legislators hear directly from the constituents in their own jurisdiction. And so um, I would encourage all of you to, to reach out to your uh, legislators and start to talk about the issues that impact your local community and your shared constituency. And that's really how I think you should think about it. Um, when you are serving a group of patrons through your library, those patrons are also served by that legislator or those legislators in the community. So you do have a shared constituency and you're really working toward this, oftentimes the same goal to bring your community along. And when legislators hear that from their own people, it just resonates so much more than from a lobbyist. Um, it's also just critically important to protect the services that we deem essential and to um, play defense on those essential services and really conserve um, the cornerstone principles of libraries and librarians. And I think if, if we just go along and everything is okay and you, you don't take action, you don't engage, we are at risk of losing ground on those essential services and those cornerstone philosophies of libraries. Um, I also think it's really important when you are a librarian 
or a board member or a trustee or a friend of the library to start advocating for what you do and what you offer at your library. And I know you're vested because you wouldn't be doing all of the work you, you're doing. It's certainly not for the pay, I assume, but um, you're vested in everything you do for your library and your patrons and participating in advocacy is just making you even more invested and in taking that um, one step further. And finally, you're the expert. As a hired lobbyist, you know, I try to pay attention to um, the philosophies and the emerging issues and what the problems are or potential solutions or innovative ideas, but I don't work in a library every day. I don't interact with patrons every day. That's what you do and you're the expert and I always think it's better for the expert to be talking to legislators. Um, it's kind of like when I have a plumbing problem in my house, I probably could figure out how to fix it, but I believe in calling the expert who will do it well and do it right the first time. So in this realm, you are the experts and, and I think that um, you should take advantage of being the experts and share that with legislators. I think it's helpful that you talked about the importance of speaking out on local issues because I, I think some some folks in the library community think that when they're talking to a legislator, they need to be talking about state issues and they might not feel as confident about that. So it's a helpful reminder that actually they can and should focus on their local community and their community's needs. Absolutely. So will you kind of describe for people how the Montana legislature works and how advocacy fits in? And I realize that you've taught classes on this, so <laughs> I know that I'm not giving you much time, but that would be very helpful for people. Yes. I'll start by saying that it's a really lengthy process. And so if someone ever says to me, this is a pretty easy bill, in my mind, I always go immediately to, it might be an easy concept to understand, or it might not be particularly divisive, but there's no such thing as an easy bill and they all take an enormous amount of work and it's a really long process and you do have to shepherd legislation from start to finish. Um, I probably you've all seen the great graphic of the bill and how a bill becomes a law. And I will, if you haven't, I'll share it with Tracy. She can share it. It, it just walks through the process in a, a very clear way. Um, what I like to talk about and differentiate is throughout this long process of how a bill is signed into law, there are many action points for you to engage with your legislators. And so I'll briefly talk about um, the process and it's going to be just a really high level overview, but I'll try to highlight all of those action points. So, and I'm going to focus on policy versus budget because there is a distinction in how those two tracks um, move through the legislature. It's similar, but budget is just more involved and longer. Um, so for policy legislation, a bill is introduced and they can be introduced in either the House or the Senate. And once a bill has had a first reading, it's assigned to a committee and in the committee, there is a hearing. And that's the, um, the, the best opportunity for public input and advocacy. Um, the bill sponsor has a lengthy amount of time to talk about the purpose of the bill, the provisions of the bill, what the goal is, and then both proponents and opponents have the opportunity to weigh in on the bill. And there's a lot of opportunity for question and answer from the committee members, both to the sponsor as well as to the proponents and opponents. And so that's what I think is one of the best action opportunities. And typically what MLA will do, if we know it's a bill that we need our grassroots friends to take action on, um, we'll match up uh, the, the committee members with librarians or the friends of the library or trustees and say we need to make those direct connections and we need you as a constituent to contact your legislator. Um, 
and people don't always have to appear in person. There's lots of ways to do it. Uh, email, text, letters, phone calls can all accomplish the same thing. And oftentimes that's exactly what we do for that action point. And then once the bill has had a hearing in committee, the committee votes on it. And the very rarely in Montana will a committee just kill a bill outright. If they don't want to move it forward, they put it on the table. And oftentimes legislation dies because it is never brought off the table and that's the end of the legislation. But it does keep the legislation alive um, almost indefinitely. So even if you think a bill is tabled, uh, you still have to be vigilant and watch it. Oftentimes the committee will just vote the bill out of committee or they'll make some amendments and then vote it out. It then goes to the chamber where it started for second reading. And that's when the entire chamber listens to the sponsor, um, fairly in-depth opportunity for question and answer. And again, another action point. So perhaps you heard from us when you're, if your legislator was on the committee and we requested you contact your legislator, we might reach out again when the full house or full Senate is voting on the piece of legislation and ask for you to make contact again and support the bill. Um, it can be amended on second reading and uh, it can be voted up or down. If it's uh, passed by a majority vote, then it will go to third reading the next day. And third reading is a simple vote. There's no discussion, there's no dialogue, but it is a good opportunity to once again have an impact and it's another action opportunity. So two days in a row, it's conceivable that we would reach out and say, we really need you to contact this legislator and ask them to, to vote no on House Bill 302. And the next day, we might have the same request, sit and ask before 1 p.m., contact your legislator and ask them to vote no. If the bill passes third reading, then it is transmitted to the second chamber and it follows that same process. So it has a, a hearing and then it has a second reading and a third reading. So we asked three times minimum for you to take action in the first chamber and we will likely do the same thing in the second chamber. So now you're up to about six action opportunities. And um, I, oftentimes people think, well, I already did that. They, they made the request and I contacted my legislator and now I'm good. But we'll try to be very specific and give you guidance and say, this is the bill, this is the stage in the process, and this is what we're asking you to do. And then the final action opportunity is um, once a bill has passed out of both chambers, um, it can go to a conference committee if negotiations need to happen based on amendments to bring both chambers to consensus. And um, there's some opportunity there for action. But then finally, it goes to the governor's desk. And that's another great opportunity to really either encourage the governor to sign a piece of legislation into law or to ask for a veto. And the Montana Library Association has done both. And um, again, the hired lobbyists can do that work, but it's often so much of a, a stronger voice when it comes from multiple people throughout the state. So that's a really brief <laughs> overview of um, how legislation moves through. But I think the important thing to remember is there are many opportunities for action. And I think it's helpful that by describing the process of the bill, you were able to explain why. Sometimes it seems like we've already asked for this um, it, because we kind of have already asked for it, but it's part of the process to ask again. And I think that's a good reminder for people as well. And I suspect that you will um, talk about this, but when you were talking about the bill and, and the call for action, I know that we have done that in a variety of ways. We've used the email listserv called Wired Montana, Wired MT, to put out a call. But I know that also the Montana Library Association has a government affairs committee, and that members of that committee have also reached out to individual librarians. So there's a variety of ways that people might be asked to take action. Yes. 
Is there uh, anything else you would like to say about how librarians and board members can get involved if they would like to, like if they're interested in maybe doing more than just reaching out to their legislator? You know, I think the most important thing is to begin to build the relationship at your local level. So build the relationship between the board of um, the library and the librarian and your local legislators. And once you have that relationship established, I think it opens the door for a lot of um, opportunity to, to have a stronger voice in the process. Um, if you just feel like, I know I have a lot to offer, but I don't necessarily want to be the person who is contacting legislators. It's outside my comfort zone. I would encourage you to reach out to the Montana Library Association Government Affairs Committee members. And I hope Tracy can share that list of who those members are. But we need a variety of assistance, whether it's just um, producing a fact sheet or writing letters or sharing ideas, talking about innovative policy ideas, um, long-term policy ideas. There's a lot of ways to become involved in advocacy, even if you don't necessarily want to be the person at the microphone in the Capitol. Um, but I will say, and I think it's worth saying that when, if you feel comfortable or even if you feel a level of discomfort with reaching out to legislators um, i'm going to say this a couple times but i want you to remember that your community leaders and community drivers within your own cities and towns and it is really important for legislators to hear from those community leaders and so by that one-on-one -on -one outreach, just slowly building the relationship, not necessarily having an official ask for the legislator, not even talking about an MLA priority, but just inviting a legislator to coffee um, or a Zoom meeting right now, or when you can into your library, just to say, I, just, I, I would like you to come read a story, it's story time. Or I would just like to show you the group of people that have um, a meeting on Thursday morning to talk about the history of the state of Montana so they get a real sense of what the library has to offer without any pressure or an official ask. And then once you've established that relationship, um, it one, it becomes easier for you to send a message and say, Senator Smith, I sure appreciate getting to know you over the last year and I'd really like you to think long and hard about Senate Bill 250 and I sure hope that you'll consider the, um, the impact it will have on libraries and then you can go on from there. But also, the, the legislators that you've built the relationship with will start to look to you as the expert. So as legislation comes across their desk and they can see that there's a direct nexus or maybe an indirect nexus with libraries, they will hopefully in their mind think, I know who I can call. I can call Tracy and she will help explain this to me. Or I can call Tracy and ask her what her opinion is to help inform how I vote. Um, and so I think those are ways that you can get involved without maybe standing at the microphone, but just I would encourage you to build that relationship before you ever have an ask. For a legislator. That's a very good point, Nanette. Mm -hmm. you know, I've been taking advocacy trainings here and they all talk about how having that personal relationship can actually mean more than hundreds of people emailing or texting them to vote yes or no. It's yeah. a very um, powerful thing we can do and it's actually pretty easy to do in Montana. And um, this will probably make you laugh, but of course, one of the things I learned when I started getting involved in this is that, amazingly enough, they're humans, just like I am. And so when you relax and you have those conversations and you get to know them, uh, it makes it so much easier and can even be enjoyable to talk to them. And, and I think, obviously, you can influence them, um, but you also help them in some ways, because a lot of them 
truly, when you really talk to them, they really do want to do the right things for their communities. And I think sometimes that gets lost and people don't realize that because the process is, I don't know, it feels pretty competitive and, you know, fast paced. So sometimes we forget those things. So yeah, that's a, that's a great point, Tracy. Both a couple of the points you made um, that they are human and we can have a conversation and most people are just coming at each piece of legislation or, or each policy decision from a place of wanting to do their best. And they're bringing their history, they're bringing their perceptions, they're bringing everything that they have to the table, but they're truly just wanting to do what they think is best for their constituents and the citizens. And if we keep that in mind, it definitely makes conversations easier even when we don't necessarily agree. Um, and then you brought up another point that I think is really worth highlighting because we've heard it, I hear it time and time again from legislators. Um, MLA will never ask you to send a form letter to every committee member or a form letter to every legislator or we won't ask 100 librarians to send the same form letter to one legislator. We hear reports every session that if two legislators sitting next to each other are kind of going through their daily letters and they have the exact same letter, they both toss it in the garbage can. And conversely, if a legislator reads one letter from someone in Flathead County, and then reads the exact same letter from someone in Custer County, the whole stack goes into the garbage. So it's really based on targeted outreach and connecting um, constituents to legislators. And you know, there are times when we have, say, um, a, a group of legislators and maybe their librarians are just not involved or not at all comfortable with advocacy. So then we find a workaround. Maybe we reach out from the president of the association saying, I understand I'm not your constituent, but I am the president of MLA and would like the opportunity to talk to you about this. Or the government affairs committee chairperson, or that's really where having that hired lobbyist um, can be helpful. So I can kind of step in and say, well, we have a hole for these legislators and, and I will manage those legislators and make sure they get the information. Yeah, I think I spend my time really trying to kind of encourage librarians and board members to get past the discomfort um, because it, it can feel pretty uncomfortable uh, when you've never done it before. And definitely first time I testified was pretty terrifying. Yeah. However, I guess it's it's pretty powerful when you do push yourself out of that comfort zone mm -hmm. and it does become easier and it it becomes something that I think can really make a difference for libraries uh, and for communities as well when people do that. And I think you did a great job of addressing some of the questions I've gotten from people who are very nervous about advocacy. And I know that the Government Affairs Committee is really looking for different ways for people to be involved. You know, because some people just writing or graphic design or whatever, that's just more comfortable for them. And so there will be op opportunities. I know the other thing that I hear, and you might have heard as well, and I think you've kind of really address this, but it might be worth saying again, is I have had people say, well, I'm not based in Helena. You know, does it really make a difference if I travel to Helena to speak, for instance, or, you know, does it really matter if I'm advocating out here at the local level? And you've kind of talked about this, but I think it's probably worth just answering that specific question that people have. Yeah, I think that's a great question. And the answer is definitively no, it does not matter if you're um, not based in Helena. Matter of fact, the lobbyists who have Eastern Montana ties, I always feel like they have a major advantage over me when they can stand at the podium and say, you know, my family homesteaded out by Circle Montana. I always just think, all I can say is I'm from Helena, Montana, and it, it, um, it really, I think, gives legislators a sense of um, the, 
the issue when people from all over the state come to speak to the issue or contact them. So if you're not in Helena, there are still lots of opportunities to be involved and your voice is just as strong, if not stronger, um, with that local perspective. And I, I would also add that um, we have a citizen legislature and they are made up of all types of professions, but there are a lot of ranchers and farmers and legislators from rural Montana. And so when they're hearing from their counterparts who are also from rural Montana, a librarian speaking to the shared challenges of rural Montana and a librarian talking about how they're trying to um, scale some of those hurdles, it means so much more than just getting that Helena perspective. So don't be, um, don't, don't think that being in Helena is the only way to be an advocate. Um, a couple of other things to that point. Since the pandemic started, and for the first time ever, the legislature during the interim has been amenable to this Zoom remote uh, testimony and conversation. And previously it's been, if you're not in Helena, you could write a letter, but they typically wouldn't read a letter onto the record. And going into the next session, I think we are going to ultimately see the opportunity for remote participation. And while some people feel very nervous about that, I think it's opening up the doors for us because it's very difficult to ask someone to take an entire day off of work, to travel to Helena, to sit in the Capitol for an hour or two hours waiting for your hearing and then your opportunity to share your compelling three to five minutes of testimony. If we are now given the opportunity to testify remotely, I think it opens the door for so many more advocates across the state um, to continue to do your job, not have to take a day off, but really share with the legislature your expertise. And whether it's in person or via Zoom, the legislative body is a citizen legislature and they are very cognizant that the people who come to testify are also citizens from every walk of life. And while there are um, rules of decorum and procedure, I have witnessed that legislators are very gracious when people either don't know a particular rule or maybe get nervous and forget um, it's never uh, demeaning or belittling, but just, you know, a, a gentle reminder of when you speak, please um, address the chairman first, you know, something like that. So while people get nervous and think, I don't know all the rules, one, the Montana Library Association, if we ask you to participate in this way, we will try to be very clear about kind of what you can expect and help you prepare, but also just know that, as Tracy said, they're human and they will treat you kindly um, and with dignity, even if you are on the opposite side of an issue. That's a really good point. And that was my experience too, when I testified and worked with them is they, they are aware that it is intimidating to address all these people sitting around a table. And so they are kind, you know, and, and directing you to kind of follow the rules. And, and I do feel that MLA, and of course I had our state librarian, Jenny Stapp, to help me. We're very good about explaining this is how it, how it works and this is what you can expect. And so I think you're right that Zoom might open up some opportunities for more librarians and or board members to testify. And, you know, I hope that this message comes across to them that they will have plenty of support and you will work with them and help them, you know, hone their message. I know I've had librarians practice on me and I'm happy to do that for them as well. So Tracy, I think the other caveat that I always like to share is, um, when you're preparing testimony or you're writing a letter to a legislator, uh, I don't think anyone does it half-heartedly. I think you put all of your passion and expertise 
into that testimony or that communication. And I, I like to just be, I don't, I try not to be a Debbie Downer, but I like to be pretty blunt and say sometimes, you know, we will have the, the best hearing planned, we'll have the most compelling testimony, we'll have wonderful librarians lined up and we'll have uh, lots of letters coming into legislators and for um, political reasons and um, other reasons that there's just outside of our control, some bills just simply don't gain any momentum. And so I, I think it can be very demoralizing when you feel like you have shared the most compelling testimony or extremely compelling testimony and then the legislative body just kind of summarily ignores it and does what they want to do. And they have reasons for the actions they take, not always totally clear to us, but um, just know that it's still worth your time to put into the communication and the testimony, and it's still worth having our voice on record to talk about the issues impacting libraries and why we would take the time to support or oppose a piece of legislation. It's still worth it, even if the outcome isn't what we would want. That's a very good point, Nanette, because I think sometimes people, they stop becoming advocates or they stop being advocates because of that, because you know they put their heart and soul into it and then nothing happened. And, really if there's anything I'm kind of learning is that it takes time and some ideas might seem really obvious to us or some policy issue might seem really obvious to us but there's like groundwork that has to be laid in order for that to legislation to pass and and that is part of that process and also I guess I have also I've learned that um speaking up on one issue maybe you you lose that issue for lack of a better way to put it however another opportunity comes along and you win and it's because of the work you did before and so yes. I'm, I'm glad that you brought that up because that is true especially for someone who's new to advocacy they might not realize it's pretty tough and there's a lot of reasons why your bill might not pass yes is there anything else that you would like to to share with the librarians and board members? Um, you know, I would really kind of segue from what you said about working with people on, on an issue that doesn't ultimately have success may result in success on another issue. I would also say that um, I've had to become very good at compartmentalizing so there's issues with legislators that I'm on the opposite side of and I just, you know, you have to tuck that drawer away and transition because on the next issue, you might align and they might be one of your best advocates. And um, you, you really do have to kind of find that way to see the humanness in all legislators and compartmentalize, even if politically you're on opposite ends of the spectrum and I, think in, in small communities, but especially, I mean, really any community, you know where your legislators lie, you know what party they're in, you kind of know what positions they take. Um, I've almost gotten to the point where I don't write off any legislators with different views. I think almost everyone is worth talking to. And um, even if ultimately we don't come to consensus on a particular policy issue, just like Tracy said, I like to keep the lines of communication open because they may become your advocate on the next policy issue that, that you didn't necessarily anticipate. I also want to let you know that I really don't think you should underestimate yourselves as community leaders and as experts um, in your field. And you, as much as anyone else, should be talking to legislators. You have the experience. You, um, I, I've just been so impressed with librarians over the years because you really bring to the table the research and the data, and um, you're very well respected at the at the Capitol. I've heard a couple different phrases to describe librarians. I told. Tracy, today I heard someone say, well, the library is really the fourth branch of government. 
And um, quite a few years ago, I heard someone say, well, librarians are the NRA of the education world. And I that was a, meant it as a compliment. Absolutely, it was. Um, so you're well respected, your community leaders, and um, you're valuable in all of the discussions around library and local government issues. So don't shy away from it. If you're interested, reach out to Tracy or myself or any of the government affairs committee members. Um, there's people who want you to be involved and are willing to help you. And then lastly, I would end with, um, in Montana, we do, I, people talk about money and politics a lot. And that can be off-putting and it can be intimidating and it can make people think, well, I don't have a role because I'm not going to contribute and I don't have money to contribute and I don't want to contribute. In Montana, we have the lowest contribution limits in the nation. And so while people talk about money and politics, in Montana, it's really relationships and politics. And I think Tracy and I have talked about that pretty extensively. But, um, you know, really the way to work with legislators is to build the relationship before you ever have to ask them for something or bring a policy issue to their attention. Just talk to them on a real human level and community leader level. And I think you'll find that. Um, it's not as intimidating as it seems. I really liked what you had to say because I think most of us would kind of like to to find a way to work together again as a society, no matter where we fall. And and you're basically saying that we have the opportunity to be a part of that, and that's pretty cool, you know. Yeah. And also, you know, you're right. You do discover. They're, that they are human very much so and it is an opportunity even if it might not be immediate um, there is an opportunity that might appear later on so thank you for that I think that's a great great piece of information to pass along um, hopefully it resonates yes <laughs> I think it will I think that is a question people have asked sometimes or or maybe even personally struggled with is is like you say there they struggle with the compartmentalizing and sometimes that can be challenging as well I will definitely um, share the names of government affairs I can put that with this recording and if you'll send me that image that is helpful the one that shows the bill process because I know that helped me as I was trying to learn about the legislature and how things work as well and I really want to kind of thank you, Nanette, because I know how busy you are, especially with the legislative session, like right around the corner. <laughs> so I really appreciate you taking the time to meet with me today. Yeah, my pleasure. You're a great group of people to work for. All right. Take care. Thanks. Bye. Bye.